All right, good evening, everyone. Now that everyone is starting to roll in, um, we are going to get started. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Um, I am Shannon. I'm a nature conservation campaigner with the Victorian National Parks Association, if you haven't seen my face before. Um, and, yeah, a huge thanks for coming to our first event in our Western Port Community Event Series, um, which is a collaboration between the Western Port Biosphere and the Victorian National Parks Association and um, with thanks supported by Coast Care. Um, and firstly, just to start the evening, we have a new record tonight. We had 488 people RSVP to this webinar. So I think that's just a huge testament for the amount of care and love for Western Port Bay. Yeah, so woohoo. Um, so celebrating that. Um, and uh, so thank you for everyone who chimed in to help shape the topics and speakers for these events and for those of you who shared it. So as voted by many of you, you have helped to shape the program for these events. And tonight we are very excited to be showcasing the marine life that lives above and below the surface um, of Western Port. And so like many of you, there are many passionate people working to discover, uncover and recover the unique marine life that depend on and make Western Port what it is known for, but also what it is unknown for, because there's so much that we're still discovering um, and that we need to be continuing to as we, um, you know, continue on this important work. So both traditional science and citizen science um, that has been done has revealed a lot. And while there's still so much more that needs uh, to be continued and deepened for our knowledge of what um, is in Western Port Bay and, and you know, and how it's been affected, um, there are many heroes who have not only been working to understand our marine and our coastal ecosystems better, but also protect them. So it is my pleasure to introduce some of these heroes to you tonight, which you will uh, see on the screen. Um, and I'll get to the marine heroes in um, a short moment. But these are the people behind some of the fascinating and really important work done to increase our knowledge and protect Western Port. So, um, and I will be introducing them very, very shortly, but also a big thanks goes out to our marine heroes that we will be focusing on tonight. The seagrass, the marine mammals, the dolphins and the whales and the marine life that do such an incredible job of shaping uh, this incredible wetland system. So how tonight will run is we will have three speakers, each be speaking for around sort of 15, 20 minutes each, and then we will finish off with a Q&A at the end and we'll finish up around seven uh, sorry, 8.15 p.m. So definitely as we go on, put your questions in the chat and address uh, the speaker that you'd like to answer the questions for you and we'll get to those at the end. So as we all know, Western Port's wetland, we all love and know um, and how special it is. And I really wanted to acknowledge um, that, you know, the country and the people who have been caring for Western Port for, you know, thousands of years, the Bunurung and Bunurung people of the Kulin Nation, you know, they are the traditional custodians of the land in which uh, Western Port, in which we live, work and play on. And we endeavour to hear from the traditional custodians about their connections to sea country as we continue this series. Unfortunately, we couldn't have this for you tonight, but we hope to um, later on in the program. So we'll keep you updated on that. So my heartfelt thanks goes to all traditional custodians who have been caring for Western Port well before it was named Western Port, um, who continue to today and hopefully well into the future. So uh, let's kick off and introduce our first cracking speaker, um, Jeff Weir. Um, so Jeff, um, if I read out, uh, I guess, his full bio, um, we'd be going on well into the evening because of all the amazing achievements he has. So I've had to cut um, Jeff's um, uh, bio a little bit short, um, but Jeff is the Executive Director of the Dolphin Research Institute, has a background in marine biology, education and business. He is an award-winning photographer, underwater photographer um, and has a consulting company, Ocean Education, um, which has involved him in tourism as, and teaching education, documentaries, school programs, writing and public speaking. And he was the founding director of the Western Port UNESCO Biosphere as well. Um, and very um, 
I guess, you know, hats off goes to Jeff because in 2019 he was awarded an Order of Australia Medal for his contribution to marine conservation. So I'll hand it over to you, Jeff. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. It makes me feel tired listening to all that. Um, <laughs> and I was just reflecting as I was preparing for this that I first dived crawfish rock about 52 years ago. So um, it's, uh, it doesn't go back before it was named, but uh, I do, I've, I know a fair bit about what's going on in there and what has gone. So first of all, I just want to share a little bit about the context of the, of the ecology of the bay and some of the history. And one of the most important things to cut to remember is this top part of Western Port is called the Western Port Sunkland. And we'll come back to that in a tick. But you'll notice on this, we've got some key spots that I'll point out. Crawfish Rock, uh, Euringa Marine National Park, French Island Marine National Park, um, Churchill Island Marine National Park. There's some really special places for nudibranchs under, under San Remo Pier. Um, we've got places for um, rogolith um, seabeds here. We've got all sorts of amazing spots. But the key thing to understand is how different the two parts of Westport actually are. And I've put this slide in because we should have a plug for the biosphere um, to re re reinforce that all of the Mornington Peninsula and all of Western Port and the surrounding region is a UNESCO biosphere, which I'm sure you'll hear about in a future um, webinar. But I wanted to share this one with you in particular. So... In the early 1800s, it was easier to get to Lake Centrinus by boat than it was to get through the Kuirup Swamp. And so a huge project was mounted, which has created dry, massive drains at the top end of Western Port. And this little diagram, this little inset down here gives some sense of what this is. It's, it's really a gigantic stormwater drainage system. And so we changed what was an incredibly huge uh, wetlands um, into something that was a massive drain that allows us to drive to Phillip Island and to Gippsland, but um, it came at a number of costs. And when we look at that in a little bit more detail, what we see is this top um, part of Western Port is very, very different to the bottom half. In the top half, we have very, very shallow water typically. We've got um, lots of blood, mud, mangroves, although mangroves missing in some parts, which is causing problems. Um, and we've got this place called Crawfish Rock, which I'll keep talking about a fair bit um, because it's so important and so unique. And then the southern half of Western Port is more like the typical sandy beaches that we all love, where you can go sunbaking, surfing, build sand castles, all the rest of it. Um, and this is at summers, and this is typical of the southern half of Western Port, whereas the top half of Western Port is more typical, like this aerial shot of Hastings, uh, where we've got the mud, we've got the channels coming through there, Western Port Marina here, where our centre is. You've got the typical mangroves inside from the mud. We've got the salt marsh and then the Malaluka swamp behind it as well, which is the typical um, structure that used to be there. Um, and you'll see that in a lot of cases, the sediment is just covering all these mud flats and there isn't much growing here at all, which is also a characteristic of how we've changed the catchment. In the northern part of Western Port, um, we've got areas that um, have, have got better seagrass meadows, but I'll leave that for um, later in this session. Um, but what I want to stress here is that some of these areas and they see these uh, mudflats that look green, a lot of this is actually microalgae and bacteria, and they're responsible for a lot of the uh, nutrient cycling for nitrogen in particular in Western Port. And so they're very, very important to the ecosystem. There are some parts of Western Port that have massive um, amounts of seagrass, which you'll hear about later, but there's also some significant areas where the seagrass has been um, displaced or is, or is taken over by calerpa bears. So this, this green algae calerpa is actually um, quite significant in different parts of Western Port now and um, is still a viable habitat. 
when we talk about places like Crawfish Rock in particular, um, it is an incredibly bio biodiverse little snapshot that actually um, has incredible diversity of hydroids and sponges and all sorts of other things there. And, and in comparatively shallow water, because it's quite dark, it's very much like um, deeper water out in Bass Strait, the sort of species, corals and all sorts of other things you get. And so we've got sponges and bryozoans and all sorts of amazing things living there. It is a true, truly remarkable spot. And I mentioned hydroids. So Western Port is really renowned around the world for its diversity of hydroids. So the tiny little hydrozoans are related to, to jellyfish and, and similar things. And they this, this slide here would probably only be about 10 millimetres in, in actual length is on with a macro lens, but you can see all the little polyps and even the tentacles there are the same in this one. But they also be a part of an ecosystem where there's all sorts of amazing things. So if you can see down on this slide here where my pointer is, is a little tiny pycnogonid or sea spider. And then we've got tunicates and we've got all sorts of things living together in an amazing spot. Western Port's also home to its very own, well, it is found elsewhere, but it was originally described um, from near Tortoise Head of these solitary hydroids. And they are truly remarkable little creatures that sometimes will grow up in fields like, I probably shouldn't say it, but lots and lots and lots of little windmills. Um, and um, they're truly special and beautiful little creatures. We have colourful things. This is from crawfish rock, tube worms, anemones. And in some parts of Western Port, they're actually hard corals, small amounts that don't build, but just chunks on rocks that are living there. And again, in spite of the wisdom of the sediments and everything else, they do very, very, very well. We have the so-called swimming uh, anemones that fill their little vesicles up with uh, gas so that they can pop up and float in the current and land somewhere where there's food. And then a comparatively recent understanding, and thanks to Dave and Fathom Pacific for these photographs, are the Brozoan reefs that are in the uh, area south of uh, French Island that are really significant, like reefs that are made out of Brozoans that are um, in some cases over a metre tall. But they're not just Brozoans, they're home to things like these sea squirts and all sorts of other amazing things. And, algae and hydrozoans and all sorts of other things. So it's a, a remarkable feature that's really comparatively recently known. So what are these little creatures called bryozoans? Um, so they can form all sorts of different things. They can form lacy little structures like this. Um, the orange one over the side have actually got their little tentacles out into the water. Some of them form these encrusting things. Others cause um, form arborescent, like looking like seaweed, like this green one here. And essentially what they are are tiny little weeny polyps about half the size of a pinhead. And they all form these um, scan these little hot, um, pockets and little, um, little structures where they live and they stick their tentacles out in the water to get food and oxygen. And so these are scanning electron microscope photographs I took a million years ago. We also have, in quite a few places around Western Port, not just down near Churchill Island, there are brachiopods. Now, I put brachiopods here because they're not mollusks. They're actually mostly closely related to bryzoans because of the uh, structure of their tentacles and things. But they open up and they filter. And most of these species, like thousands and thousands and thousands of them, are only known as fossils. Um, but Western Port is one of the few places in the world where these brachiopods still live, and that's truly remarkable. Decorator crabs, this one was at Flinders Pier. Little, this was another Flinders Pier shot, I think, of Dave's, a little hermit crab. And I threw this one in, this is actually an introduced species of crab, but I threw this in when I was looking through the photos because this crab here is soft and mushy and has actually just molted. So this gives you a real life example of a malted uh, exoskeleton right next to the crab after he's pumped himself up to the next size, which is pretty unusual to see. So I threw that one in. These ghost, crab, ghost shrimps are really incredibly important in Western Port because 
What they do is they live and burrow into the mud so that they actually create opportunities for oxygen to get down into the mud, which is important for the whole ecosystem. So they're an incredibly important part of West, Western Port. And um, I believe they're also uh, listed under FFG. But in all the mud flats, these little guys do an incredibly important job burrowing and scattering. Crayfish. There's a place in Western Port that I won't mention exactly that has squiggins of tiny little baby crayfish. Um, and it's quite amazing. And in there, there's also other things like the corals and some of the other bits and pieces we mentioned. Seagrass home to all sorts of species, nursery ground for all sorts of small fish as well as yaki and everything else. Uh, nudibranchs under San Remo Pier in the channel there is, is well recognised as a very special area for protection because of the biodiversity of these little guys. Different types of fish, dragon net, clownfish, these guys, of course. And I've thrown in this because it's actually worthwhile if people don't actually know how these sea dragons feed. It's actually quite amazing. So they don't open their whole beak like a bird would. They just have a little tiny trap door at the end. And they open that little trap door and then they've got a funny little thing on their neck that opens up very quickly so it sucks in the water like an eyedropper does, medical eyedropper. And so when you open it up like that, the water gets sucked in and they feed on these tiny little mice and shrimps. Seabirds. Um, I, I won't go into all different ones because there's so many and so important. But um, what I do know is that there are six species of seabirds in Western Port that account for more than 1% of the global population. That would mean something like 70 million people if it was 1% of us living in Western Port. So 1% of the global population is pretty amazing. As is this little bird, hardly anyone's heard of a ruddy turnstone. So when we talk about this, it's always an eye opener. But this little guy, two years running, uh, was satellite tagged at Flinders and two years running, did a 24,000 kilometre Father Christmas trip to the North Pole or to at least to Siberia, Siberia where they feed and they mate and lay their eggs. Quite amazing. We have the world's largest Australian fur seal colony. Um, as we speak, the numbers are picking up, getting ready for mating. 35,000, I think, or at least 30,000 was the latest count that I'm aware of. Um, none, none left by the early, by the end of the um, you know, 1800s or so, and the numbers have picked up well. And I've put this one in, and this is my last one, because this time of the year we get lots of phone calls from concerned people because last year's yearlings start to get kicked off seal rocks. And if they don't go on seal rocks, they'll get, they'll get crushed when the males are mating with the females and marking out their territory. And nature is evil. It's tough. And so a lot of these little guys won't survive because they're just pushed out to feed for themselves. And so it's very common to get them along inside Western Port and all, all along sort of close to these sort of beaches along the coastline. So that's me done, and I think, about on time. <laughs> so thank you. And there's a couple of dolphins swimming off near the sunset, which is not actually not Western Port, but, you know, um, the sun... Doesn't, you don't get much Western sunsets in Western Port unless you're on the other side. So there you go. All right. How's that? I'll stop sharing. Um, here we go. That's great. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, such a wealth of knowledge there and a, a, a whip through many uh, incredible species that are home in Western Port. And I think, you know, it, it can be easy to think of Western Port as just a, you know, a mud flat. Um, but when you actually look down under the surface, the amazing um, colourful sponges and, you know, bryozoans and the reefs there is, is truly incredible. So definitely encourage anyone to get out there and pop a mask and snorkel on and get your camera out and go exploring. Um, so uh, 
The next speaker I want to introduce um, definitely comes to mind when you think about whales and dolphins of Western Port, and it's uh, Dave Donnelly, who many of you will no doubt know, um, and really stoked that Dave's going to be sharing all about the resident dolphins that call Western Port home and the learnings from over a decade of whale citizen science. Um, so Dave is a Melbourne-based marine researcher with a passion for marine conservation. Uh, Dave, Dave's expertise is in largely in marine mammal research, um, which has taken him across the world in the South Pacific, New Zealand and the Antarctic to study whales, dolphins, seals and sea lions. Um, for over 25 years now. Um, he's currently employed um, together with Jeff at the Dolphin Research Institute and he's responsible for vessel-based activities and running of the two citizen science programs you're going to hear about tonight, Two Bays Whale Project and Killer Whales Australia. Uh, he's also employed with Melbourne-based environmental consultancy Fathom Pacific where he engages with offshore industries providing expertise through the required environmental planning and environmental impact assessment processes. So welcome, Dave, um, and over to you. Well, thank you, Shannon, um, and thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, thank you to Jeff for a fascinating insight into Western Port. Um, you always learn something when Jeff opens his mouth, and, uh, and tonight's no exception. But uh, I will follow on from, uh, from my uh, illustrious leader and uh, take you down the path of marine mammals, or at least uh, cetaceans, in, uh, in Western Port. And um, today's opening slide photo um, is a photo taken just outside the boundary of Western Port. Given that the talk tonight is about whales and dolphins, it seemed fitting to include this photo showing both whale, a whale at least and, uh, and two dolphins. That's a humpback whale spy hopping in the foreground of two common dolphins passing by just, uh, just to the west of our seal rocks. So uh, with that, I did say the word cetaceans and, and for those people who are unaware, um, so stand by here, we just got a little, there we go. Um, so what is a cetacean? Um, a cetacean is a reference term given to all whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Um, it's the order that they all belong to. For your, uh, I guess, your learning this evening and your notebooks, um, whales and dolphins occur in, in large numbers across all of Australia. Uh, many of them in Victorian waters. However, porpoises, or porpoise, I guess, um, are not known from Australian coastal waters. There has been a couple of records. So um, for those old school folks um, who we always used to call dolphins porpoises, um, you can keep doing that if you like, but uh, but know that, do that porpoises do not occur in our, in our waters. Um, so they are marine mammals. They're warm-blooded. They give birth to live young. They feed their young on milk. And there are two types of cetacean. There's the toothed whales or the, uh, or the odontocetes and the mysticetes, which includes the baleen whales. Now, baleen whales are a group of animals which are vast in their description and the way in which they appear and their distribution. They, they look very different across different parts of the world. And in our part of the world, I'll start with Victoria, we have about eight species of baleen whale that we know occur in our waters. Um, also, we see in the screen here, down towards the bottom right, we have a toothed whale. This is actually a dolphin species known as a false killer whale. And over here, of course, one of my favourites, um, the killer whale, which again is a dolphin species. In fact, it is the largest of all the dolphin species. So we're here to talk about Western Port. And we need to understand how that works for Western Port in terms of whale presence. We'll start with the whales. So in Victoria, we'll start with a wider view. In Victoria, we have year whale present year round, really. Some of those animals are seasonal. In fact, all of them are seasonal. During the summer and autumn months, we see blue whales appearing off our coastline. We also have passers by such as killer whales and other dolphin species. But in winter and spring is when it really kicks in for Victorian coastal waters. It's a very, very important part of the world for southern right whales particularly for the southeast population of this large baleen whale. Um, humpback whales use the area as a migratory corridor. Dwarf minke whales are visiting from time to time. And again, killer whales are showing up in both winter and spring, as well as our other dolphin species. So whales in Western Port, what do we know after a decade of citizen science work and our own survey efforts? Well, not much, really. We know that there is two key species. 
that the humpback whale and the southern right whale both occur inside Western Port and the open coast near to Western Port. These photos were taken inside the bay. This one here by uh, Ben Carroll and over here, uh, Andrew, and I've forgotten, if you, Andrew, if you're watching, I've forgotten your, uh, your surname, this photo of a southern right whale. In fact, a pair of southern right whales off shore and beach, if anybody here recognises this bit of coastline here. Humpback whales and southern right whales do not really uh, use Western Port for any significant um, life cycle behaviours. They're usually only present between the months of May and September, and in pretty much every case, they are just passing through. So in other words, Western Port is not considered an area of significance for either species. And for those of you who read some uh, EES reports in the past, you would note that the blue whale was also mentioned in those documents. Um, for Western Port, that's not something that happens. There's been no records of blue whales within the Western Port. However, on the open coast, sure, they are. They do occur there from time to time, but again, passing by. Other species are known to appear in Western Port. However, the evidence is largely absent. We have just a handful of records of unidentified large whales, which we think might be Brutus whales. That's a really interesting species when you think about Brutus whales. Typically, these animals uh, have been known as a subtropical to tropical species, but we're now starting to see them in temperate waters, particularly down around the northern Bass Strait and central Bass Strait regions and also eastern Bass Strait. There's very little known about this species in our region, and we think that their appearance may have something to do with the uh, ever-changing climate that we're currently living in. So I said we don't know much about the whales that occur in our, in our part of the world, particularly in Western Port. We don't know why they're there. We don't know if it's a blunder on their part, if they're just investigating or just passing by on their migration to the to northern waters and back again. But what we do know is that they are large in numbers and they're constantly moving through our, our space. However, the dolphins of Western Port, we know a little bit more about, but still, we don't know a lot. The dolphins of Western Port are restricted to bottlenose dolphins. At this stage, we don't have records of common dolphins entering and using Port Phillip. Oh, sorry, Western Port. How dare I say Port Phillip? Uh, they're currently fairly poorly understood, but we are building an understanding very, very, very slowly using citizen science and dedicated efforts by our volunteer groups at the Dolphin Research Institute. We have photographic records of animals that have been frequenting areas of Western Port dating back to 2006, with some anecdotal evidence from the 1990s, including myself visiting the area as a, as a young boy at, at Shore and Beach where we had a family beach home seeing the dolphins swimming just off from the from the reef there. But unfortunately, back then, I didn't carry a mobile phone in my back pocket, therefore photos are sparse, to say the least. But what is exciting is the photos that have been provided to us through not only our own work, but also some very dedicated citizen scientists, including people like Rosalie Vernon and, and Sasha Guggenheimer, have, have provided enough evidence to help us start what we call a catalogue of animals. Now, a catalogue of animals is something that represents known individuals which have been identify, identified using key features of those animals, a, bit, a little bit like a fingerprint as, as a human. But we don't use their fingerprints, given that their fingers are currently wrapped up in a flipper or a pectoral fin. We, we use their dorsal fins. We believe that using this information, we have been able to identify that there's an apparent residency, um, mostly localised to the Shoreham to Summers area. These animals are sighted regularly, particularly during the summer months. And we do have some evidence of breeding success with animals surviving through, but we also have some concerns around survivorship, um, calf survivorship, that is. Some, I guess, some unexplained deaths of very, very young dolphins um, right in that region that I spoke about before, that being the summers to, to Shoreham region. So that's something that we're investigating now. We're trying to get more and more information as best we can to try and understand what the survivorship is like of these animals. Why is there only 18 that we've recorded so far um, to the level of, of individual identification? So what, what's happening with the dolphins in Western Port? Is the no, low number representative of competition with the larger apex predator, that being the fur seal? Or is it just simply that the habitat is not suitable for large groups of uh, to bottlenose dolphins? To keep, just use a comparison briefly, um, other areas of Victoria um, the Gippsland Lakes and Port Phillip 
they sustain population levels or, or resident groups of upwards of 50 animals up into maybe 120 animals uh, using those spaces um, year round. So there's something going on which is different in Western Port. And there always is because Western Port is a unique location as we just learned from Jeff. So here's a few examples of what we found using the photos provided to us by, um, by citizen scientists. A couple there might have been taken by Jeff also. Um, so what we've been able to do is identify some key animals which have been within the, uh, the region since 2006. And these animals include Annie at the top left, Ginger on the right, and, and Freddie down there at the bottom left. We're not quite sure about Felix, but what we do know is that these animals have a very, very uh, strong social bond. When you see Annie, you almost always see Ginger. When you see Freddie, it's something similar to that. Um, and of course, we're starting to see the calves appear and grow up. Um, I, its name escapes me of who this calf is, but it could well be Prince. Um, Prince is one that was born about three years ago. So we're very excited about the opportunity to be able to study animals so close to the coast, um, particularly um, almost right at our doorstep, making life a little bit easier. That means we don't need to take vessels out on the water. But when animals live close to the coast, um, it's inevitable that we start to see interactions which may or may not be so good for the animals or the locals in the area. Um, this is one of our um, uh, resident bottlenose dolphins from the Summers region. Those boys in the background are just outside the uh, Summers Yacht Club. And as you can see, this animal is uh, uh, either approaching swimmers or swimmers are approaching it. I think it's a little bit of both. Um, we've all seen the footage of the racehorses and dogs interacting with these animals. And I guess what we've learned from the past, in particular from uh, seals interacting with humans, is it doesn't often end well. So this is something that is, um, is on our minds. We're keen to keep monitoring it. Um, we're keen to hear from people who are local to the area to see what they're seeing and hear their stories and perhaps even to use their imagery to help us understand um, a little bit more about what's going on in this region. And speaking of understandings, it is our current understanding. So we don't just grab information and, uh, and squirrel it away. We do do something with it. And this is the work of our interns um, who have been putting together uh, not only the catalogue, but the life history of some of these animals and their carving and, and, the, and the frequency of the, uh, of the interactions and the sightings. Um, so as you can see, if you glance quickly at some of this information, you'll see that we've been seeing these animals for nearly 20 years now, at least some of them. So it's really, really exciting to be able to have um, a, this little group of animals to study um, and be able to not only understand a little bit about what's going on in Western Port, but also give an opportunity to our next generation scientists to start creating their own projects around uh, the Western Port region without having to rely on vessel operations and other things which require uh, coxswains, boats and, and a whole range of safety concerns. Uh, they can simply sit on beaches and talk to people and, and take photos and record these animals. So we're very excited about that opportunity moving forward. But it's not all up to the interns, uh, or myself, or Jeff, or our, or our, uh, our, um, our research fellows. Um, it does largely come down to citizen science. And citizen science is um, not an emerging thing. Some people do call it an emerging um, information source. It's been around for decades, and we just didn't call it citizen science. So if you have a mobile phone, if you have um, a pair of eyes, a pair of binoculars, a camera, or anything like that, you can consider yourself a citizen scientist. All you need to do is go and look out into the water and see what, if you see anything. If you do see something, you can report what you see. Now, lots of people report what they see, but it's usually on social media where it gets about a 15-minute life and then it disappears again. Our aim uh, is to change that way of thinking. It's not just about the social media, but it, it can be about the conservation and better understanding of these animals feeding into programs and EESs and things like that, which are going to help the animals and their habitat um, by capturing that, um, that information and putting it into um, something useful that you saw earlier, which can be referred to and supplied for, for reports and uh, just general knowledge of the region. So we have a little thing which we call um, PodWatch, and it's quite easy to use. It's what we call a, um, a web-based app. It doesn't require you to have a login. It doesn't require you to sign off your, your firstborn, uh, buy anything, renew anything. When you change your phone, you simply go straight to the website and click uh, save icon to home screen and you've got it back again. And there's no updates, that's all our headache. Um, so here's a, just a quick screenshot of what it looks like 
um, when you get onto the landing page. It's very intuitive, very easy to use, and we do hope that uh, after this presentation, some of you might consider um, heading out, having a bit of a look around, and perhaps sharing what you see with us. So uh, for me, I think that's going to be uh, where I leave it. But um, I'd just like to thank again um, the VNPA for having us tonight um, and to be part and to be rubbing shoulders with um, with people like Ollie and, and Jeff and to be able to hear more about the things that I don't know about. And hopefully I've been able to share something that you guys didn't know. So uh, please uh, hit us up with some questions at the end and, and that's where I'll leave it. Thanks, Shannon. Great. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, it was great to learn a lot more about the residency of dolphins that are found there. And um, yeah, definitely, definitely you've inspired me to go out there with my camera and just um, see what I see. So just another urge to encourage everyone, um, if you have seen um, um, some of that really important info that Dave mentioned before, definitely go on and, and, and log that one. Um, so any questions for uh, Dave, please pop them in the chat. Uh, and we're going to move on to Ollie now. Um, so Ollie is going to be sharing his uh, wisdom around Beyond Just Mud, um, mapping vital seagrass ecosystems in Western Port. Um, and Ollie noticed um, a, a, real, a real gap, I guess, in the seagrass knowledge and data to inform our understanding of seagrass and what was happening in Western Port and decided to change that. So um, um, Ollie has been doing um, or has done his um, important work on seagrass um, as part of his PhD, which he's going to share with you tonight. Um, so as a postdoc researcher at Deakin Uni, um, he's worked a lot in the fields of marine mapping and ecosystem restoration. Um, and his primary research interests are in seagra seagrass restoration, where he uses spatial science principles to implement spatially informed management and restoration of these key ecosystems. And Ollie completed his PhD mapping and monitoring the seagrass in Western Port and has a passion for protecting this important embayment from unnecessary development um, and anthropogenic stresses and climate change. So over to you, Ollie, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, just quickly share my screen. Uh, swap those. Um, awesome. So thank you so much for having me folks. Um, obviously my name's Ollie and I'm a spatial scientist and a restoration ecologist. Now that might be a bit la di da kind of uni speak but essentially it means I make maps of stuff, I work out where things live, where they used to live and why things tend to kind of change in the environment and restoration ecology is all about identifying where we've lost these important habitats and trying to reverse that trend. So Let's talk about Western Port. Western Port is a gem in Victoria's crown, but a lot of people that aren't familiar with the site tend to just see it as a load of icky, muddy um, mud flats. And a part of that is warranted. A lot of Western Port does have um, these large, incredibly important mud flats, as we've heard from Jeff. And it's my job tonight to convince you that they're not just mud because Western Port has a tremendous amount of biodiversity when we zoom in on these important wood fat systems. And that's in part due to these habitats called seagrasses. So as Jeff has mentioned, seagrasses are a marine plant. They're not an algae. They have a real root system, very similar to um, the kind of runners that you'll get on a strawberry. And yes, as a seagrass ecologist, I get upset when people call them algae. Um, it's very, very, very triggering. If you take one fact home tonight, it's that seagrasses are a real plant and they're not algae. We're in the world, there's around 70 species. I'll let the taxonomists decide specifically how many because they love to argue about stuff like that. But in Western Port, we tend to have um, four main species, and all of them are incredibly important because they have roles as habitat for juvenile fish. They maintain our coastal water quality. They protect shorelines from erosion simply by being there. So this is super important for areas like Lang Lang and the kind of north and the east of Western Port that has that really fine, muddy kind of cliff-like structure to it but also they reduce aquatic pathogens and they act as a, a rest stop for migratory birds, which is part of the reason why part of Western Port and its intertidal mudflats are designated as a Ramsar site of very, very high significance. Now, 
you might be thinking, cool, Ollie's told me seagrasses are awesome, but how much is in Western Port? And is it healthy? And specifically, where is it? And these are the types of questions that I've answered with my research in the past and that I still undertake today. So Western Port seagrass kind of story is all very dependent on when you look at the assessments because it's had a bit of a, a turbid history, um, if you'll pardon the put. So um, Western science first started mapping seagrasses in um, Western Port in around the mid kind of 70s. And back then, essentially, if you looked at an intertidal mudflat, there was evidence there was some degree of seagrass on these mudflats. So in all of these maps that I'll show, um, if it's green and it's showing seagrass, I'm not saying that it's the dominant habitat type, not saying it's all chock-a-block with seagrass, because as Jeff has said, it's almost like we get a load of mosaics. Some areas there's seagrass and it will intermingle with kind of algae or just bare mudflat, and all of them are as important as each other. Now, I wouldn't be a restoration ecologist if this was the status quo right now. And 10 years later in the next mapping assessment, we saw large declines of seagrasses within the bay. And there's not really one key um, kind of smoking gun to point to with this. A lot of it is associated with changes to the amount of sediment that's in the water column of Western Port. And that in turn is associated with all that kind of channeling and mucking about that we did with what used to be the Kuirup swamp off. Um, the bays northeast that Jeff spoke about at the start of his talk. But if we continue going through these historic assessments, about a decade later, we started to see a little bit of recovery. And by the turn of the millennium, this kind of 130 square kilometers type number was pretty much the status quo. Now, this is where I kind of come into the mix. So in 2018, I moved from the UK, hence my accent, to Australia to start undertaking my PhD in seagrass restoration. And I distinctly remember being sat in a meeting with my bosses from Deakin Marine and Melbourne Water, and they showed me this exact figure, and they said, cool, Ollie, this is where the seagrass is. We know you like maps and you're a spatial guy, so this will be up your street. I remember raising my hand and going, folks, this is already two decades old. Do you not have a more recent map? We really need to monitor these things, right? And they said, no, Ollie, we don't have a map. So my first chapter of my PhD was generating and updating the spatial assessments. So I spent a month out on Western Port in um, the summer of uh, 2018 with a colleague of mine, Jimmy. We visited over 300 locations in the bay, checking whether there was seagrass there or what the dominant habitat was. And then we combined that data with satellite images through a process called remote sensing, which is essentially like doing painting by numbers using a computer. So if there's big areas of seagrass in the image, they come up as bright green and we can use things like bathymetry or water depth to teach the computer that if it's on an intertidal mudflat and it's a really dark green, then there's a decent chance it's seagrass. And then the model or the computer will go through and do predictions across that satellite image. So when we did an assessment for 2019, we started to see way larger predictions than we thought. So it suggests that Western Port has been continuing to recover whilst no one's really been looking, such that we're now looking at a vaguely similar spatial extent, kind of 200 square kilometers versus the original 250 square kilometers to the assessments that were done in the 1970s. Now this looks like the job is done, right? Ollie's telling me we're pretty much there, but the reality here is that we, we need to consider density with seagrass as well. If you imagine you look at your lawn in your garden, you've got a real nice healthy lawn, there's loads and loads and loads of blades of grass all jammed in together. So that would have a really, really high density. But the density requirement for this map is only about 10%, which can be relatively sparse. So as I mentioned at the start of this talk, if it's green, it's there, but it doesn't necessarily mean that seagrass is the dominant habitat in that area. But the overall trends in the north and the east suggest that seagrass is coming back. And as Jeff has said in his talks, the, these areas of Western Port are traditionally seen as muddy and kind of impacted by all this channelization. So by and large, it suggests that this issue of sediments and the turbidity is beginning to lessen slightly 
as the current systems in Western Port kind of naturally flush that stuff out, we're getting more light and the seagrass appears to be sorting itself out. But this got us thinking, in particular, it got us thinking about whether we could give this process a bit of a kick up the rump and speed it up a little bit. And that's where I'll start talking about our restoration efforts. So restoration is by and large the process of reintroducing habitat into an area where it used to be, but it no longer is there for whatever reason. So you might have a healthy meadow, it will decline due to whatever reason, maybe someone ran it over with a boat and there's a big scar in there. We would then come in and try and replant these important habitats to return to that existing or the, the historic assessment. Now, this seems very easy. One big thing that changes with restoration ecology is this idea of a suitable environment. Now, seagrasses are plants. They are um, specific to their environment, but they also have a specific set of needs like all species will. And this idea of assessing suitability, as I will call it, is very similar to gardening, or if anybody in the audience really loves houseplants, you do this all the time. You don't take your Boston fir that might be your, your prize house by your favorite and put it next to a north facing window such that it cops sun for 12 hours of the day because it's going to go brown, it's going to get dry and it's going to look really, really, really sad, right? So essentially we assess this throughout the bay at the same time for the seagrasses so that we know that we're not putting um, biological materials, so seeds or shoots or little plants into an area where the environment is simply too harsh or just flat out not right for the plants to grow. Instead, we want to be targeting our effort in areas where the environment is okay for the support of these important systems. All right, that's great. How the hell do we do that, right? Now, coming from the UK, um, my background is in marine science, but also a lot, a lot of machine learning. So peak nerdy computer stuff. And essentially, I put my nerdy computer coding hat on and approach this problem with a kind of data engineering point of view and built a computer model, as is my default setting with most of the problems in my life. So essentially, we built this computer model that says, OK, if I give you a specific location in Western Port, and I tell you the environmental parameters that um, we find there when we visit it, or that have been predicted there in these kind of bigger bay-wide models that management agencies have. I want you to tell me, does it have enough light for the seagrasses? Does it have too much? Does it have too little? And then do that same process for all the other environmental variables that tend to predict where these plants will live. So you've got things like temperature, salinity, depth, wave forces, and um, lots of these things. If they're not in that kind of Goldilocks zone, the seagrasses are super fussy, then they simply won't grow. But another big consideration with this work was that climate change is going to muck up everything. We don't know what the future is going to hold in the kind of near term, so as close to 2030, let alone what is going to happen in 2090 or 2100, right? So we had to include a degree of uncertainty in this work. So we took the most recent climate predictions and we applied them in the model and said, OK, computer, only show me areas that are environmentally suitable now so that I can go out in my waders and start planting. But also they have to be suitable way in the future under the worst case scenario in 2090. And essentially the computer goes, cool, I'll give you a number between zero and one. Zero being absolutely don't plant there, it's rubbish. And one being... This is very, very similar to where you find natural seagrass in Western Port. You probably want to shortlist this area. So when I take that model and I put it on Western Port as an area and say, hey, predict for 2090, we see this map. So anywhere that's green is termed an area that we might want to look at to house future restoration work. But also the darker the green, the more good it is or the more suitable it is. Now we see around 100 square kilometers, even under the worst case, most pessimistic, grumpy scenario that this model can put out. Now, to me, as a spatial nerd, 100 square kilometers kind of clicks in my brain as a rough area. And I, I understand the scale of it, just as if I said to you, how big's an A4 piece of paper? 
you'd have a kind of mental link there. And you might not have that with 100 square kilometers, right? But what if I was to tell you that it's actually 6,000 MCGs worth of potential space to target restoration or assisted recovery in? Now, that's a tremendous amount of space that may have slightly denuded or degraded seagrass meadows that could do with a bit of help, or they might be completely bare such that we could look at trying to put um, seagrass meadows back in there, should they have been there in the past. And in particular, we see that the main areas that are suitable for restoration are again, the north and the east of Western Bork. So it almost feels like mother nature is giving us a sign here to say, hey, it's naturally recurring in these areas. Your modern Western science is telling you that the environment is suitable in these areas, and therefore you should start focusing in these areas for future work. But again, 6,000 MCGs is a whopping great area, right? How do we know where to start trying to put these little seagrasses back into the environment? There's a million and one ways you could assess this question. You could simply say, which one is easiest to get at in from boats or shore access? But one way we modelers like to do it is to bring in more ecology, more biology, and really try and understand the system a little bit more. So we decided to look at dispersal. Now, I appreciate it's what, half past seven on a Wednesday. No one wants an ecology lecture. So just term dispersal as the movement of stuff. In my instance, it's seagrass seed pods between habitats, where each habitat is an individual seagrass meadow. So essentially, we're looking at the chance that seeds and shoots can go from one healthy meadow whoop, to another healthy meadow. And this is really important from a spatial science perspective, because more connections mean more support, and more support means a more resilient habitat. So it's the same way that a community of people is strongest when all neighbours are able to help each other out. It's exactly the same, but instead of providing cups of sugar or glasses of milk or whatever you need, you're providing seeds and shoots to, to your adjacent um, neighboring meadows. Now that's with existing meadows, right? That's where all the current seagrass is, is whizzing around. We can also start looking at what happens if we were to put a restoration site in this network. So we can start estimating the degree to which a restoration site would receive stuff from existing meadows. Now, this might be really helpful because that restoration site, once restored, we're going to leave it. And ideally, it needs to be supported by the existing meadows in Western Book. But also, we can look at the inverse. We can look at choosing the best restoration site that once we restore it and it produces its own seeds can actually help the existing meadows. So by and large, to start subsetting this 6,000 MCGs worth of area, we can target restoration areas that either receive more seeds, so those spots are more likely to survive, or when we restore them, does that area have a really high capacity to help its neighbors? Now, we did this again, as I say, all my problems are solved with an early computer model by doing more dispersal modeling. So we gave it um, a map, of where the existing meadows are, a map of where the restoration sites are, and we also gave it lots of information over the last decade of what the currents do in Western Port. And we essentially said, okay, predict where these seeds are going to float around across the bay for the last decade. Then we take the average of that and we produce maps like this. Now, I appreciate this looks a little bit like a spider walked across a well of ink and decided to do a little dance. So I'll walk you all through it. This map is showing, first off, the existing meadows in red dots. So they're the areas that we're not really concerned about. They're high density assisted meadows. They're our neighbors that we're trying to interact with in our restoration project. And the restoration sites are in this kind of beige um, and they have a variable size. And in this map, it's showing you the restoration sites that have the greatest support from existing meadows. And I'll give you no prizes for the one that came out as the winner, 
because there's only one site in Western Port based on our modeling work that has a really, really disproportionately high inflow of seeds from its neighbors. And that's these restoration sites that are on the north of French Island. So these might be a really good place to start subsetting the 6,000 MCGs down to maybe only one or two MCGs worth of area because they'll be really well supported if we can get restoration to start there. We then did it again, but used that inverse argument. And when you do it this way, again, with existing meadows in red and restoration sites in beige, you can see that it's those northern sites again, but in particular, the north of French Island and the north of Western Port that really have the greatest bang for buck. If we got restoration sites into them, then they'd have the greatest capacity to support the neighboring meadows. And also there's a little guy south of Coronet that we might want to start looking at too. So in summary, we can see that Western Port is incredibly special and is far more than just mud. That seagrasses are recovering naturally, but we might be able to speed this up a little bit. That large areas of restoration are um, available for us to focus our efforts in. And that northern restoration sites might offer the most bang for buck and are probably a good place to start. Now, I know what you're thinking. Ollie's been talking for a minute or 20 minutes here, and he's not told us anything about how they actually restore meadows. And that's because that's not my job. My job is dealing with where, and I'll leave it to my friends and colleagues, the Seagrass Sisters, um, in a later session with Shannon to talk all through how we do the restoration work, how you guys can get involved, and the type of methods that we're using to do just that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ollie. Um, definitely one of my key takeaways is plants, not algae, plants, not algae. Um, so I hope everyone has has that one um, locked away um, for when you need it um, to impress your friends or something. Um, but um, I think the future is pretty exciting if you're a seagrass pod. So um, plenty of potentials there. So thanks, Ollie, for all your important work, um, finding out all of that so that we can improve the way that we manage um, Western Port into the future. So um, now is the part of the evening where we get on to answer your questions for our speakers. So just a reminder, if you've got a burning question, pop it in the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, so we're going to start off with a question um, for Jeff, um, with, which is, what aspects of the bay make it conducive to survival of those rare bryozoans that can no longer survive elsewhere? And maybe Dave also prefer to chime in as well. Yeah, I might like to add to this Sim simple answer is I don't think I've got a really simple one. Um, it, it 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 is clearly a spot that is has survived at the moment that there is a lot of a question about damage due to boats anchoring in that area because it's obviously a, a great habitat. So there's fish in the area as well. But Dave, you might like to add. Um, yeah, look, you'll stretch my memory here. It's been a while since I worked on Brazoa. But um, one of the things that have, is a take home from what we've learned in particularly the area known as the corals is that um, algae, proper algae, not seagrass, um, <laughs> seem to struggle to grow in that area. Therefore, they're not inundating the reefs due, due to the uh, light penetration, um, the turbidity uh, creating a situation where light can't penetrate. Um, high tidal flow um, with suspended nutrients helps with that situation. Uh, the orientation of the of the reefs is also um, conducive to, uh, I guess, uh, ca capturing as much productivity as possible in that particular region. Um, we've since discovered a couple more locations apart from the corals, which at the moment are kept fairly well um, secret, just because, of, as Jeff mentioned, the damage from anchor drag um, which is something that Ollie mentioned with the seagrasses as well. Clearly, um, and I'm just thinking about this now, clearly there's a message to come out of tonight's presentations, and that is that um, boating in Western Port is impactful um, and that perhaps we uh, as a community might like to consider some better boating techniques to help preserve some of the habitats in particular, because without those habitats, we don't have the dolphins. 
Um, so I, I'm just sort of thinking off the top of my head right now, Jeff, and I know I've gone off, off track a little bit, but just hearing what Ollie had to say, what you just said, um, we're all about protecting habitats. If we protect them, we don't have to restore them. So perhaps that's something to consider for all of us online tonight. <laughs> And just a couple of other thoughts as you've been talking that many marine invertebrates, um, actually the um, adults give out chemicals that the, um, the larvae and the plankton can sense and then they know where to pop down. And what happens when you get these physical things growing on, on things, even if it's on a pier, pylon or wherever, is as soon as they get to a certain level, you get... Um, calm spaces between the structures and then that facilitates more larval larval growth and bryze islands also um can, uh, can some of them can branch and keep branching and branching and branching as well so yeah. for, the, for the record tonight um the the bryze island reefs of western port when they were discovered and that, that was shared with colleagues around the world um, every single comment came back from high-level academics who've been studying these things for decades, said put a fence around that immediately. That's one of the last remaining uh, strongholds uh, in New Zealand. They don't exist anymore due to commercial fishing and they haven't recovered at all. They're, and they're probably just restricted to fossil records and deep, deep water environments now. So Western Port is really, really, really important for Bryzone reefs. Great. Thanks, guys, for that. Um, that's a really good one about um, boating, um, you know, stuff that could be introduced to help protect some of these important areas. So, yeah, I'd be keen on that conversation as well. Um, we have something from Susan um, for Jeff. Um, thank you for your interesting presentation. Can you tell me what I should do if I ever come across a seal yearling stranded on the beach or should I call Wildlife Victoria? Um, it's the Marine Rescue Unit that's based at the zoo. So if you just do Google on your phone for the MRU, um, you'll you'll get the phone number to contact the, them at the uh, at the zoo who respond to seal issues on behalf of the department. Great, thanks, Jeff. I can't remember the number. <laughs> um, great. Okay, so we have one for you, Dave. Um, are sharks an issue for dolphins in Western Port? Um, good question. Um, no, we don't believe so. We don't think there are an issue for dolphins in general, um, unless you happen to be a sick or injured dolphin. Um, the few shark-related uh, deaths of dolphins in the Western Port area have been associated with animals which had a pre-existing condition, so already compromised. Uh, large bottlenose dolphin on the southern side of, of uh, Phillip Island had uh, serious white shark bites on it, but we also, on post-mortem or necropsy, discovered that it was suffering from pneumonia. So we've yet to find a, a dolphin that we could say has died as a, a fully healthy dolphin that has died directly from a shark attack. Uh, not to say that it couldn't happen, um, but just remember that dolphins are social animals and often hang around in, uh, in relatively large groups and are very protective of their young. So um, I think if you're a shark, you probably want to pick a better target than a dolphin. But uh, it's a great question and, and one that we don't really know the true answer to, but we think that's the, this is the case. And the other one to add that's related to that is that um, more, so more of the penguins, for example, go and feed in Port Phillip than in Western Port. And there's a, um, Western Port is such a different ecosystem where so much is tied up in the mud flats and the seagrass and, and everything else. It's not, and it's not as much as in the water column. So you get different species. And um, so it probably helps to explain why there's so few dolphins. Um, you don't get that many seals as well coming into Western Port to feed. It's, it is a very, very different place to say Port Phillip. Yeah. Very true that. Um, Dave, another one for you. What forms the basis of dolphins' diet? In in Western Port, um, that's, a, that's a great question. We know a fair bit about what happens in Port Phillip in terms of diet, but typically um, for bottlenose dolphins, they like to chase things like um, garfish, uh, snapper, squid, um, just sort of that bite-sized type, um, not necessarily juvenile fishes, but um, those mid-sized fishes, they happen to be some of the same ones that recreational fishes target as well. So uh, 
Um, we have done only a little bit of field work in Western Port. It's mostly been land-based from our um, citizen science teams and uh, volunteers. Um, so diet is something we don't know a great deal about in Western Port at this stage. But if you were to base use Port Phillip as a surrogate, those were the species that I would uh, list high on the priority list or the, the dining list for dolphins. Great. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Ollie, one for you um, from Stephen. Um, are all seagrass species equally fragile, sensitive to environmental variables? That is a very good question and one I could talk about for a very long time. The short answer is no. Um, essentially, you can get really, really tiny seagrasses that their life history is, they're a bit like weeds. They'll, they'll go into an area, they'll colonise it, but they're pretty weak. They're not like um, a big resilient plant. So they'll go in and start stabilizing sediments and stuff. And then other seagrass species will come in and you essentially have this, this succession where the pioneers, your kind of holophilas and the little guys will come in and start kicking off that process. And then bigger species will move in. And it's those bigger species that are really, really tolerant. So if you look at say the Mediterranean, for example, you get these groups called Posidonia, and we do get Posidonia Australis over in um, uh, SA and across in WA. And this is, it's huge. It's like 40 centimeters long blades, blades as thick as my finger, and it just refuses to die a lot of the time. You have to really, really kind of muck around with it to kill it off. But the species that we have in Western Port are a little bit more sensitive, um, especially the intertidal ones that we have as Zoster and Mullerati purely because we've got such an intertidal extent in Western Port. So that coupled with the increases in temperature associated with climate change could be a bit of a kind of disaster waiting to happen because those guys just get baked um, as the tide goes out. And there's only a degree of tolerance which they, uh, well, can tolerate. Um, so yeah, there's a tremendous variation and that's something that we tend to look at in the restoration work. Great, thanks, Ollie. Um, this one I'm going to put out to uh, whoever wants to answer, but it's a question from Dale, um, and I'm just summarising it here. Um, given that um, poor water quality from the catchments um, has been identified in various EPA reports, um, what, how can waterways running into Western Port be restored or improved when the land is changing with increased residential developments and agricultural production? Um, I, I might start with a couple of little bits to that, and that is that there has been some progress. The other thing is that the uh, most recent Westernport Science Review tend to show that Westernport's actually coping at the moment with the nutrients pretty well. So all those combination of seagrass, algae, microalgae and bacteria are doing a pretty good job. Um, but that we can't rest on that. They can easily get tripped over the edge and we can end up with problems. Um, look, the one thing that we need to really take out and shake the trees with, and this is a big picture one, and that is the new Environmental Protection Act introduces a duty of care. So it does to the environment legislation what what um, work care did for people working on roofs. You used to only get fined if someone fell off and broke their neck or leg or something, to, so, but now you have to do all the right things. So right now the law in theory means that any farmer, any local government, any state government agency or whatever that aren't showing an environmental duty of care can in theory be prosecuted. Now, the problem is that we haven't been able to test these things in court yet, but the onus now is on everybody. In theory, we could be prosecuted for just cleaning our car in the driveway and having it run down into the gutter. So the duty of care applies just like work cover applies now, and that's probably the strongest tool we've got to try and push upwards and get some test cases happening. That's a big picture. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Um, Dave, Oli, did you have any other comments to add to that? I think just adding to that, um, Jeff's point is so pertinent that we're almost seeing this regime shift. Like the, the little guys, people that care about the environment, have finally been given kind of a torch to hold and a tool to start pushing back on these people that want to like 
develop in Western Port or the urban expansion of Melbourne that is sitting on the fringes of the bay, right? Um, so I think the timing of trying to get this kind of broader Western Port management group together and consolidate this wealth of information that exists couldn't be more pertinent because not only have we been giving a legal tool, but also there's a kind of societal coming together and I guess a spiritual coming together to fight for what we care for. And like my hope, as I've said to you in the past, Shannon, is that we can get Western Port up there in the same way that Port Phillip Bay is and have uh, a Western Port fund and Deca to kind of respect the bay in the way that they respect Port Phillip Bay because of all the shipping and the money and the tourism and whatnot. So, yeah, I think we're, we're in a critical juxtaposition here with the, the future of Western Port. So it's awesome to be in seeing what 500 people coming to a talk in the middle of the week um, and spending their evening with us. It's, it's, it's awesome, awesome stuff. Yeah, great, thanks. Oh, oh, Jeff, did you have something you wanted to add? Oh, look, again, under the New Marine Coastal Act, well, it's not new anymore, but it, it's actually conceivable you could get a, um, an environmental protection plan for Western Port in exactly the same way as Port Phillip has got an environmental protection plan for it. Um, and then the only other one is I think there's room to be positive as well because I know the work that um, we did through the biosphere on the Watson Creek catchment is that we, we found some really fantastic landowners and there was a lot of really positive things there. So it's not all doom and gloom, but I think we've got stronger tools now um, and um, looking at how the Marine Coastal Act works, now Melbourne Water is the catchment management authority as well. Um, there are a lot of institutional things that can work together, and, and I think we, there's scope to do more things. And I might just um, add to that, because that's a really great thing I wanted to mention tonight as well, that um, the Western Port Biosphere, VNPA, have been working um, with other groups like, say, Western Port and Phillip Island Conservation um, Society and a few other um, groups and, you know, First Nations tourism, um, you know, conservation and businesses to um, to really try and get up a, a holistic plan that looks at Western Port Bay and uses some of this really important knowledge that we know um, to really leverage and, you know, the way decisions are, are being made um, for Western Port and how it's managed and planned for to address these, you know, these challenges that um, that it's facing. Um, and so if anyone is wondering what this, like, QR code here um, is on my screen, people can scan that and actually goes to a website that has lots of information and you can take action and sign up to support. Um, but that's, and we're also working with, you know, councils and government on that to try and get a commitment um um, up as well and, and work together on, um, you know, having that, um, the future that we all really want for Western Port into fruition. So, um, and I think the link for that will be also be popped in the chat. Um, but I think we might even just, or oh, just quickly, let's just go one more question um, from Rowan um, before we finish up for the evening. And it's to Ollie. Um, and it's just about the seagrass in the northern shore of Phillip Island, just west of Cowes. Um, accessible to beachgoers and damage, does this cause irreparable damage? Tricky to say. Um, humans will, will have an impact on the meadows, um, but the species that we have, because they sit in that continuum, pretty much in the middle. So if you have these, these pioneering species, they're really, really fast to grow, they're kind of weak. And then you get the guys on the other end, which are really, really slow to grow, but they're really, really hardy. The species in Western Port kind of sit in the middle. So they have a really good um, recovery, regrowth potential. So as long as the impacts are kind of single, like if we're talking about kids doing sandcastles or tourists walking along the meadows on the, the kind of upper fringes, and that only happens in summer. And then the meadows are given a chance where they can kind of cool off and they're not constantly getting bashed by stresses. They probably will recover um, such that we won't see any kind of long-term inter-annual change. But it's when we start getting consistent changes to things like water quality or big impacts like building a new harbour or um, new sewage outfalls or plants and stuff like that. They're the real stresses um, for the seagrasses on site because by and large, they're, they're pretty tolerant. Um, even if they die off as individual plants, 
the meadow itself will kind of fill that gap pretty quick. Great, thanks, Ali. Um, so we have uh, a gazillion more questions to ask, but unfortunately we don't have time. But thank you so much, everyone, for writing um, your questions in. Um, we're Hopefully we can keep a record of these um, so we can um, try and address some of these questions at our future events. Um, and um, on that note, this is not the, the first and last event in this series. We have another online event um, for around about the end of November and then an in-person event with a field trip uh, in probably February next year. So everyone that is here tonight and is RSVP, you will definitely um, hear more about upcoming events that you can take part in. So uh, thank you all again so much. The recording will be sent around along with some other information um, that we've spoken about tonight. Um, and also just yeah, wanted to give one last thank you to our speakers, um, Jeff, Dave and Ollie for sharing your incredible work um, that you've been doing over the years. Um, definitely Western Port is, um, we've been able to share this knowledge thanks to your work. So thank you again and everyone joining at home, have a great evening and um, enjoy me again thanking the speakers.